afternoon. Today we uh, start a new new uh, subheading under the comma. This is uh, <coughs> titled as uh, Park Dana Pariyaya. Kamma Chaturka. Park Dana Pariyaya. It means uh, fourfold comma based on how it would give results. Here actually it is not referring to any type of result. Here we refer to uh, the results of Patisandhi Vipaka, of Patisandhi Vipaka, giving a rebirth, giving a rebirth. So when a Kamma is about to, uh, when someone is going to die and get uh, rebirth in the following life, there is an order in which the Kammas come forth to give the next Patisandhi. So based on that, Kammas are explained as fourfold, Garuka, Asana, Achinna and Katatha. Garuka, Asana, Achinna and Katatha. Garuka means heavy, like heavy. Garu. Sometimes Garu refers to the teacher also. So here Garu means, Garuka means heavy Kamma, weighty Kamma. Asana Kamma means Kammas that are done proximate to the death, close to the death, in the vicinity of the death. And Achinna Kamma is the habitual Kamma that we practice maybe daily, weekly, monthly, annually. Uh, if we keep on doing such a Kamma, it is considered as a habitual Kamma. Katatta Kamma means Kamma which is not specified either as Garuka. No, neither as Garu, either as not, not specified either as Garuka or as Achinna or as Asana. <coughs> so in this lecture, I'll be mainly focusing on Garuka Kamas. There are various types of, uh, few types of Garuka Kamas and uh, some information would be valuable uh, in order to avoid the Akusala Garuka Kamas and also to uh, perform the Kusala Garuka Kamas. Akusala Garuka Kamas, if done, uh, there is no remedy within one life, so it's it's irre 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 how to say it cannot be reversed, right? It cannot be uh, reversed in, uh, in the, within this life. So it's better to have a very good understanding about this garuka kamas. And uh, if a garuka kamma is done, akusala garuka kamma is done within one life, he is certain to be born in the hell in the next following life. It is impossible that he would be able to avoid the rebirth in a hell. Some much, how much he perform, how much meritorious deeds he performs, it is not possible to avoid the rebirth in a hell if someone has done a Garuka Kama. So if you read the uh, first paragraph, every life is an outcome of a Kama. Moreover, every life is, life is preceded by a previous life because there is no beginning in the mind stream, in the sansari khanda stream. A new life occurs as a result of the kamma that had received the opportunity to produce the rebirth. Right? So, aladdo uh, okasa then laddo kasa. Okasa kata and laddo kasa. Before the death moment of the previous life. So, only when the, before the death moment of the previous life, when, we, when a kamma gets the opportunity, that kamma is going to produce the rebirth. Except one life that when we pass away from the asanya sattva. In that life, there is no chitta. I think I have mentioned this in the footnote, in 145 footnote. And there is an order in which the Kamma comes forth at the dead moment to resolve the next Patisandhi. It is important to have knowledge about this. right? So there is an order. So that order is mentioned Garuka, Asana, Achinna and Katatta. So if you go to the Garuka Kamma, uh, paragraph 10.77, it's called the Beti Kamma. Its heaviness is in terms of giving a uh, sense of powerful in yielding its results. They get the opportunity over other three types of kammas in giving the next rebirth. Another name for them is Yaggaruka Kamma. You can find this in the commercial literature, Yaggaruka Kamma. Garuka Kamma are twofold as Kusala Garuka and Akusala Garuka. So first we discuss about the Akusala Garuka. Akusala Garuka is three types of fixed wrong views and the five heinous deeds. Kusala Garuka is are the eightfold jhanas. 
all the ninefold jhanas, eightfold jhanas in the fourfold bay, eight jhanas, four rupa vachara, four arupa vachara. If you go on the fivefold method, we have nine jhanas, right? Eight or nine jhanas are the kusala garuka kamas. Then, with regard to akusala garuka kamas, they cannot be stopped. Uh, from producing their result in the immediate as the immediate rebirth. There is no way. You remember the story of King Ajata Sattu. He is uh, uh, designated in our sasana as the one who had the strongest faith among the Putujanas towards the Buddha. So the minister had to plan how to inform his uh, Buddha's death to this king. Because they knew because he loved the Buddha so much that it could be a shock and it, there was a possibility that the king could, uh, something could happen to the king. So, so that much love, faith, attraction he had towards the Buddha. So in our literature he is considered as the, who had the strongest faith towards the Buddha among the Putujanas. Among the Putujanas. So, how, and he supported the first council and he did lots of meritorious deeds. But, and also he built a one stupa after the Buddha has passed away. We know it as Vala Sanghata Chetya. So, yeah, from where the uh, King Asoka took the relics, to my, my, my memory was correct. Still we have that site, that the Vala Sanghata Chetya. So, he did lots of merits uh, according to the literature, but it was not possible uh, to prevent his next rebirth in the hell. So, therefore, there is no way that we could stop this Garuka Kamma, Akusala Garuka Kamma, giving the rebirth. So, therefore, if you, you can find the bold letter, Saggavarana Kamma, in that paragraph, Saggavarana. This is called Sagga, which covers the uh, blissful abode in the next, for the next rebirth. So, that's called Saggavarana. Uh, within the same paragraph, 10.78, with bold letters, Saggavarana. Saggavarana means... A kamma that would prevent someone from attaining the sukati. Sukati means blissful state after the death. So he is destined to be born in a woeful realm. Right? So then uh, uh, these two kamma, these akusala garuka kammas, akusala, not the kusala, akusala garuka kammas are also termed as niyata kamma and anantariya kamma. That is also mentioned in the bold letters. Niyata Kamma and Anantariya Kamma. Why they are called Niyata? 10.78.1 Niyata Akusala Kamma Kamma that are the, uh, uh, Kammas or Kamma that is or you guys better say a Kamma that is fixed in unfailingly giving a rebirth in hell after death. Just printed mistake. A Kamma that is fixed in uh, fixed to give a rebirth in the hell uh, uh, immediately after the re uh, death is called Niyata Kamma. It's fixed. Then Anantari Akusala Kamma means a Kamma that will yield its result. Its result, sorry. Will yield its result immediately after the death of the life uh, in which it is been done. Anantariya means immediately after the death. Niyata shows its fixedness in giving a rebirth. Unfailingly giving rebirth. So that's why in the next paragraph we mentioned the term Anantariya indicates the deeds attribute of bringing results in the immediately preceding existence and the word Niyata refers their certainty, certainty of giving result. There's also a pretty mistake, certainty, right? Certainty in giving results. So that is uh, Akusala Garuka Kamma. So I'll be explaining the Akusala Garuka Kammas bit in, uh, in detail. Niyata Micha Dikti. There are three types of Micha Diktis explained in our Sasa literature. First one is Akiriya. If you go to the next page, you find uh, Nartika and Ahetuka. These are the three. These three were advocated by three of the six heretics who lived while the Buddha was alive in Rajagaha. So Akiriya Diti refutes the idea of Kusala and Akusala. Uh, according to Purana Kasapa, who was the advocator of this uh, wrong view, uh, view uh, said that there is no capacity in the Kamas that we do in bringing a result. It means they are not designated, they cannot be designated as Kamas, uh, whether uh, they were done with the uh, uh, how to say, pure mind or a pleasant mind, unpleasant mind, they don't have that capacity. That is what his idea was. 
so he mentioned that even a person uh, from the south southern air region from the river gangs if he keeps on killing a huge amount of beings there is no karma that is he has gathered so uh, another simile how much meritorious deeds he does how much great number of charities he makes they, those karmas are not going to give results in future. So he denied the capacity of the karmas to give results. That is called Akiriya Diti. That they are not capable in giving a result. So that was his uh, idea. You can see this in the Samanya Palasukta, detailedly explained. Akiriya Diti. Then we go to the Natika Diti. Natika Diti means he denies the Vipaka. It's the same, same uh, two sides of the same coin, if I say. Natika Diti. Natika Diti means he denies there are no Vipaka. So his focus is that there is no result of a karma. So he ultimately, eventually, he denies the rebirth. So these are the, in literature, you find a very uh, popular word, Dasa Vattuka Mitha Diti. Dasa Vattuka Micha Diti, ten fall wrong views. Ten fall wrong views. Dasa Vattuka Micha Diti. So they were the, he said there is no merit, no vipaka in giving dana, no vipaka in supporting the mother, no vipaka in supporting the father, there is no being who will be born after death. So these types of views were advocated by this uh, uh, teacher and he also mentioned it is impossible that someone could attain the ultimate enlightenment with his own efforts in the years and preach the Dhamma having understood the true phenomenon of the world. So he, he denied the possibility of Buddha even, who is able to understand the phenomenon very clearly. And also he mentioned, this was preached by uh, as a speak called Ajita Kesa Kambila. Kambala. Because he wore a cloth made out of uh, hair. Right? It was made out of hair. It was very uh, not pleasant to wear, made out of hair, human hair. Right? So his cloth was made out of hair. Ajita Kesa Kambala. So this, uh, as uh, Venerable said, also said that the uh, human life is a constitution of uh, uh, seven parts, four great elements, Sukha, Dukkha and Jiva. So when someone dies, the four great elements will merge with the great elements of the environment and the Sukha, Dukkha, Jiva are the mental elements, right? Uh, no, sorry, he mentions that... Uh, uh, yeah, not the seven elements. He mentioned that the mind, mind element, the mental elements would uh, go to the space. That was his idea. So it would go to the space and there is no, nothing is going to give results after death. So he also mentioned good and bad actions has their destiny till the grave, till the graveyard. They will not, not go beyond the grave. That means they are not going to follow. There is no, no rebirth. That was his main idea. So this was Ajita Kesa Kambala's idea. Natikavada, he refuted the vipaka of a karma. Uh, Purana Kasapa refuted that uh, uh, there is nothing called a karma. There is nothing, you know, karma doesn't, actions doesn't have this capacity. Then we come to another view called Ahetuka Diti. Ahetuka Diti means non-causal view. So there are, we can find two types of non-causal views, but they are all also similar. So here, there was a teacher during the Buddha's time, he was called uh, Makkali Gosal. Makkali Gosal. This Makkali Gosal mentioned, specifically he mentioned that Everything in the sansara is fixed. Everything in the sansara is fixed. There is no cause for the defilement. Defilement means not the uh, chetasikas we call the defiling, the uh, defiling of a being. Abstract now. And there's no reasons for defilement and purification of a being while he is wandering in sansara. They are supposed to be born in different certain type of number of lives that within a duration of 
184,000 eons kappa. Right. There are kappa also, he had a definition that a huge lake, when it is being uh, dried out slowly, uh, once a 100 years, you take out some little amount of water, so then it, uh, as I remember, for, to, for it to dry to one time, a few times. So he had a definition of kappa. Here. So those kappas, 184,000 kappas, a being would wander in the sansara, and in the end, he would, uh, his sansara would end eventually. So like a thread, like a ball, uh, how to say, uh, with the thread, if you roll the thread from a top of a mountain, it would roll and roll till the uh, length of the thread. So after the, after the entire thread has been finished, spread out, spread, the ball will stop. So likewise, the sansara, the length of sansara of life beings is determined. Not, not only the length, all the suffering and pleasures are determined. He mentioned dona mite sukha dukhe. It means sukha, happiness and uh, suffering is like already measured. Dona is one kind of a measurement. So we can say 5 liters, 10 liters. So all the beings have, will encounter this much, um, this amount of uh, happiness and suffering. There is no, whether you put effort, you are not going to reduce the suffering and you are not going to increase the happiness. So all these efforts, Nati Attakare, Nati Purisakare, all your efforts are in vain. So a wise man would not end the samsara quickly. No fool will wandering sansara longer so everything is destined after wandering in the sansara for a certain amount of period the suffering will end so this was his idea so it was a fixed view so we call it Niyatavada Ajata Sattu also commentary called it Niyatavada and King Ajata Sattu recommended this recommended this, uh, he uh, uh, referred to this view as Sansara Suddhi. You can you see in the second paragraph of the topic, Sansara Suddhi. Sansara Suddhi means because uh, a, a, a being would get liberated from the Sansara in this manner. There is no other way that you can get out of this suffering. So this was his view. There is no cause for the purification, no cause for the defilement of a being in sansara. But the thing is, he did not deny the rebirth, like Ajita Kesa Kambala. Ajita Kesa Kambala said there is no rebirth. But Pura, uh, Makali Gosala said there is a rebirth, a limited number of rebirths in a, during a certain period of time. So his view is Buddha considered this is the most dangerous among all the wrong views. Buddha greatly refuted or rebuked this ascetic uh, because uh, it was like uh, very attractive and also very dangerous as, as his uh, uh, idea was, Buddha's, right? And if you go to the fourth paragraph under the topic, in some, if, in, uh, so if, if someone considers, if someone considers that everything in the world arises and happen, Without everything in the world, arise and happen, right? Arise and happen without any cause. This is also a ahetuka. Everything happens without a cause, right? This is also ahetuka. Then there is another ditty called Sabhavavadi. Sabhavavada means that everything happens according to nature, right? According to happen the nature. So, uh, I think in present days, uh, people are more inclined to it. They, no one would say everything happens without a cause. They would say there is a cause. But that cause is discerned by the nature, right? Sabhava. So, uh, I'm not going to talk about this vada at this moment. This uh, also denies, this can also deny, seems like, uh, deny the uh, rebel. So, but uh, in the commentary literature, we find these three views. Ahet, uh, Akiriya, Natika, and Ahetuka Dittis are considered as the fixed wrong views. Then a question comes, how could a person be born in the hell by holding these three views? It is mentioned that not everyone who ad, uh, believes or everyone who admires these views will not be born in the, uh, will not be born in the hells. For that, he has to put effort. 
not a uh, how to say uh, a normal savaka of these teachings are not going to enter the fixedness of this view it's like for example if you think the normal buddhists would i mention about uh, attainment that you will be fixed niyato sambodhi parayam you enter into the uh, stream of the noble noble good and you will surely end up in the nibbana for that you have to put effort you have to work hard to go to the stream entry right and to uh, go into the towards the nibbana so likewise to become fixed to become well established on these views a yogi has to uh, practice a lot so that is what 10.794 says a commentary a commentary states that just adhering to any of these three views is not considered as committing a garuka karma for that a person has to meditate upon these ideologies and attain firm confidence which accepts any of these non karmic non resultant non causal theories the moment he comes into a firm adherence about these false phenomena he is said to have accumulated an akusala garuka karma he learns the doctrine from the teachers he study they memorizes them he recites the doctrine he comes into a seclusion and keep on contemplating thinking about these ideology he uh, uh, compares with the experience that he has compares with the world so like by he keeps on contemplating and at a certain time he comes into a conclusion it is impossible that there is something called karma and vipaka it is impossible that there is a rebirth it is impossible that someone can get liberated from sansara by effort so when he when his mind get convinced about these ideologies by himself not by listening just not just keeping faith on the teacher when he get convinced by himself that is the moment we call he commits the garuka karma this attainment is called nichatta niyama then we also have samatta niyama the difference is samatha niyama is the magga attainment of magga samatha niyama okkamati samatha niyama itself is the magga michatha niyama is this uh, coming into this fixed idea ditti gata sampayutta chitta lo mula chitta so at, at a sir when he keeps on with as as the magga chitta arises in a certain uh, mind process to a to a to a practitioner buddhist practitioner in the same way a person who follows these wrong views when he contemplates at a certain time a vidhi arises making him fully confident that he accept these views that there is no karma no results or no way of purification uh, with effort within the sansara so some scientists would say that there is i am convinced that there is no way that karma or result these things can happen it seems like if someone contemplates and understand comes into a firm faith within himself not depending on the teacher when someone becomes sota panna buddha buddha refers to him as aparapachya sattu sasane aparapachya sattu sasane means he doesn't depend upon anyone else to believe in these teachings he doesn't need the support of another to have faith about rebirth about the nibbana about the validity of this practice because he has understood it by himself aparapachya sattu sasane he is not depending on others with for to uh, in this sasana the same way to believe in this sasana the same way a saman who attain the nichatta niyata is not believe in not following what the what the teacher says he himself is convinced that there is no rebirth there is no karma vipaka and there is no way of purification it in the sansara or getting out of the sansara if it is fixed so likewise uh, a person who comes to that level is called have committed the akusala <coughs> sorry garuka karma otherwise in samyutta nikaya you find students of disciples of these six heretics three of them according to our literature ajita kesakambala makkali gosala the first one was purana kasapa 
So these three were considered to have, to have considered to have advocated the fixed wrong views, fixed wrong views. So they, any of uh, disciples of them, all the there were six heretics. So six uh, teachers. So disciples of these three even were born in the divine realm. So they respected these teachers. Surely they would have admired their view. So therefore, it is not that just admiring or just adhering to these views are not going to, not making him fixed to be born in a awful realm. So it has to come into the level of Nichatta Niyama in order to be born in the hell because of the wrong views. That is a very important point. Just following or uh, believing what others say is not going to make him a Nichatta Niyama person. Right? So then we go to the next type of uh, Akusala Daruka Kamma. Five types of heinous deeds are as follows. Five types of heinous deeds. So this is very famous in, uh, within the Buddhist literature. So there are five heinous deeds. They are Sangha Beda, making a sh shishim, skissim, making a skissim within the Sangha. Then uh, shedding the Buddha's blood, Lohi Tupada. Then killing an arahant, human arahant, killing a human mother, killing a human father. These are the five heinous deeds. So among them, uh, making a schism within the Sangha is considered the most, is the heaviest. It's called Sangha Beda. You can see this in the handout. Sangha Beda. Creating a schism in the Sangha order. This can only be done by a monk, fully ordained monk, Upasampada Bhikkhu. So, for that, there is a procedure. Procedure means way of, way of making a schism. It's not just making a schism means making a, a, a conflict among the monks. It's not considered as a Sangha Beda. Yes? I'll come to that. I'll come to that. Right? So, uh, skis, uh, just making a dispute among the monks is not considered as Sangha Beda. For Sangha Beda to happen, one Criteria is criterion is that he should be advocating a false doctrine, some kind of a point, like some point of views. They are called. There are Buddha has mentioned in this list in Parivara Pali and Sangha Bedaka Tantaka that eighteen facts, eighteen reasons of dispute. This is called Bedaka Vatu. is Pali Atthasa. Atthasa Beda Karvatu. Some of them are. What the Buddha has mentioned, a monk says, it is something that Buddha has not mentioned. Something Buddha has mentioned, he considers what has Buddha has mentioned. For example, if someone says, Buddha never explains Satipatthana, this advocate, advo, advocating advocation is Beda uh, Karvatu because he is telling something which is, which is advocated or mentioned by the Buddha as not mentioned by the Buddha. Buddha never mentioned that Rupa is Nicca, Deva world is Nicca, permanent. If someone says this, this is also a reason of dispute. Also, Vinaya rules that Buddha promulgated. If someone says, no, Buddha never said do not to, for example, Buddha never said to uh, eat, or how to say, Buddha never said monks to eat afternoon. So this is like he is cutting off or he is refuting or rejecting the Vikala Bojana Sikhapada. So if someone advocates such a false doctrine or something that the Buddha has not practiced as something has practiced, Something the Buddha practiced as not practiced. So, if these, there are 18 types of such reasons for dispute. So, if someone is purposely, knowingly, that is the very important point, knowingly 
that this is wrong. He brings this issue and he convinces another group of monks. Sangabeda cannot be done by alone, by himself. He has to convince another group of at least four monks. So the person who does the Sangabeda, if I take him as one, he convinces another group of monks, four. Oh, another group of monks convinces. Then it has to be Sangabeda has to happen officially. There should be official recognition within the Sangha order. Official recognition happens in most of the cases if not all, a with a Vinaya Kama, formal act of Vinaya, with a formal act of Vinaya. So normally a formal act of Vinaya is done in a Sima. There are various Simas, Gama Sima, Badra Simas. Whatever it is, we take it as a Sima, for example. In ancient days, even the Badra Sima, you see a Sima house today, very small. In ancient days, the entire monastery was a Sima. The entire monastery was the Sima. Sometimes uh, in the Rajagaha, Sariputta made a Sima because we can spread the Sima for three yojans. It means uh, if you take roughly maybe more than 40 50 kilometers sometimes. So, uh, the, with a diameter. So, the, in the Rajagaha, the entire Rajagaha was the one Sima for months in those days. So, uh, now within a Sima, a monk. Within a Sima, monk convinces. Convention, uh, convincing can happen within or without the Sima, it doesn't matter. So he convinces four monks, and there are another four monks who are not convinced. Maybe they are against or they are not convinced. So there are another at least four monks within that same Sima. While there is another four monks who are not convinced, a monk convinces another four monks, takes them to his party, and does a Vinaya Kamma, either Uposaka or any Vinaya Kamma, even a minor Vinaya Kamma, in a Sima where other monks, more than four monks, are present. Not just a Vinaya Kamma, the convincing should happen because any of these 18 facts. Not just a re not just they are doing a Vinaya Kamma because they don't like to do with other monks. For example, when the other monks are present, I do a Vinaya Kamma in the Sima because I don't want to go with them. This is not called Sangha Veda. Sangha Veda always should happen based on these dispute reasons. And we should know that he is doing something wrong. Purposely, he should know that. So then, with that intention, for the sake of his own benefit, or to break the Sangha, to uh, how to say, divide the uh, unity of the uh, Sangha with these evil motives. He convinces another four with false doctrine, at least four, and do a Vinaya Kama in a Sima, where there are another four, at least four monks in that same Sima who are not convinced. When he does such a Vinaya Kama, at that time he commits the Sangha Bheda, Apusala Kama. So, if he convinces less than four, or if there are less than three monks within the Sima, these are not considered as Sangha Veda official. Because to consider the Sangha Veda, the Sangha has to be divided. According to Vinaya, Sangha is the less than, according to Vinaya point of view, Sangha is, at, to represent the Sangha, there should be at least four monks. Less than four monks or three monks is called Gana. Four monks is called Sangha. So, there should be a Sangha who doesn't agree with him, there should be a Sangha who agrees with him. So, in such a case, at least there should be Buddha mentions to Venerable Upali in the Vinaya. At least, Upali, there should be nine monks to do a Sangha Veda. And this also has to be done by a monk. He mentions a Bhikkhuni. Samanera, Samaneri, Upasaka, Upasika cannot make a Sangha Veda. They can only create a dispute. They can bring the flames of Sangha Veda. So, when the dispute is running, uh, spreading among the Sangha before this formal act, so that uh, damage of the unity is called Sangha Raji. The Sangha Raji. It's just 
uh, uh, the, how the unity has been cracked, not completely divided into two. So it becomes officially divided when he does the Sangha uh, or, or, or Vinaya Kama or the Uposata. So, so therefore, the Sangha Veda has can be done only by a monk, full-fledged monk, and by convincing other monks, at least four monks with a false doctrine, Attakara, Attarasa, Vedakara, Vattu, any of them, one is even one is enough, convince others, and doing a Vinaya Kama in a Sima where there are at least four monks who are not convinced of his view. So then it is considered as Sangha Veda. That Kama, after he had the Honorable Devadatta, did this Kama in Rajagaha or Gaya Sisa, I promise you. The Gaya Sisa, as I remember. And then after that, he was destined to born in the uh, hell. So in the, after it was done, when the Buddha was also in the same Sima. So when the, it was done, Buddha mentioned in the Itibutta Kapali that a person who does the Sangha Bheda would surely burn in the hells for the entire lifespan of the Avicii of the hell. When someone does some other Anantariya Kamma, there is a possibility that he may get out of the hell without spending the entire lifespan. Like Ajata Sattu would spend only 60,000 years in, the, in a minor hell of the Avicii because of his strong meritorious deeds. But Sangha Veda is Kapathai because he is dividing the unity among the virtuous group called Sangha. So therefore, there is no way that he would get rid of this, uh, how to say, uh, get rid of the hell uh, without spending the entire lifespan. So this is considered as the heaviest among all the heinous deeds, all the five Anantariya Kamas. So, yeah, then uh, also he mentioned, Buddha mentioned in Tivutta Kapali, if you go to the page number 51, page number 51, second paragraph, as the Buddha has mentioned in Tivutta Kapali, a person who creates a schism within the Sangha order will suffer in the hell throughout the entire lifespan of the Niraya. This statement is an indication that the Sangha Veda will, Sangha Veda Ka, the one who does the Sangha Veda, will not be free from the hell in between his lifespan as it is mentioned to happen with King Ajata Sattu. This notion is affirmed uh, in the commentary on Majjhima Nikaya. Moreover, a person who unites the Sangha will also enjoy pleasures in the heaven throughout the entire lifespan in the realm he is born into. And another point of mentioning is this when we come to Sangha Veda. Uh, yeah. Is it? Uh, anyway, so there is another one now, one who participates in the Sangha Veda Kakama. For example, this is the person who commits the Garuka Kama, not the participants. Participants are, two, are normally called Sangha Veda and Vattaka. They are called Sangha Vedhan Vartaka. Sangha Vedhan Vartaka means who participates in the act of breaking the Sangha. They are twofold. Some participates knowing that they are doing the wrong thing. So in the, in the Devadatta's case, there were three monks. Kokalika, Katamodaka Tissa and Samudha Datta. They were the three monks who participated in the Devadatta's group knowing with the evil intention of breaking the unity of the Sangha. But the remaining, there were 500 now newly ordained monks who got convinced by Devadatta because of the five uh, vara he asked, the five opportunities he asked uh, from the Buddha. So they had no idea that 
that uh, they were doing a, they were participating in a false vinaya karma. So the commentaries say if someone participates in this sangha bedaka karma, sangha bedaka karma with an evil intention, they are they are not committing a garuka karma, but it is like a garuka karma because they have without their participation karma would not be successful. So they are also accumulating a very heavy karma. But the ones who are innocent, who has no idea that they are doing such a uh, heavy deed, uh, participating in a heavy vinaya karma, would have would not fall into any fault. But if someone, according to the vinaya, if someone participates in the sangha bedaka karma, if someone does the sangha bedha, he becomes parajika on the spot when the vinaya karma is done. He is no, he is not going to have the monk life anymore. Buddha mentioned if someone does a Sangha Beda, he should be disrobed immediately and he should not be ordained again. This is another kind of a Parajika mentioned by the Buddha. It's found in the Mahavaka Pali. But for the Sangha Beda and Vartaka who participated here, their Upasampada is still valid, but they commit an uh, offense called Tulachya. When Sariputta brought the newly ordained innocent monks, to the Buddha and Sariputta had an idea that they should be reordained because he, he was a Savaka. So then he asked the monks, Buddha, how should I reordain them? And the Buddha mentioned, you should not think of reordaining them, you just make them to confess the Tulachya of it, that's enough. So the Sangha Beda and Vartakas are not committing Parajika, but the Sangha Bedaka person commits the Parajika. Uh, on that, uh, when he finishes the Vinaya Kama. Not only Sangha Vedaka, one who sheds the Buddha's blood also commits the Parajika, Lohitu Padaka. So the other three are killing. So killing a human is always normally Parajika. Killing mother, father, and Arahan, there's nothing to say. A monk losing his monkhood. But uh, they are not related only to monks. Uh, Sangha Vedaka is or can be only done by a monk. Yes. <laughs> Better means uh, he is not going to commit the Sangha <laughs> right? But it's uh, very heavy, right? Uh, yeah, I mentioned this in the second paragraph. Participants of this Vinayaka are called Sangha Beda Anuvartaka. You can read it, right? So they were the uh, Anuvartaka. So if you go to the next next Kama, next Garuka Kama, Lohitu Padaka, para paragraph number 10.80. 802 Lohitu Pada or Ruhitu Pada. It means shedding the Buddha's blood. The, comment, the literature says that Buddha's body is unbreakable without his consent because of his merits that he has done in the past. Rohitu Pada means someone harms the Buddha with an evil intention, so the blood, his natural blood flow flow will be interrupted. So some blood gathers in a position like it's a, it's a how to say when you hit something uh, on your body, it gets swollen, right? The blood starts to get stuck in that area. So likewise, even a small amount of blood, the flow of the blood is interrupted. Even the amount that can be drunk by a small fly. So th this much of blood is interrupted by an evil intention. So this is called uh, shedding the Buddha's blood. So, uh, and also just make causing the Buddha's blood to come out like uh, what the Jivaka did. He didn't commit a, a kusala, he committed a very huge kusala because his intention was to bring ease to the Buddha. Buddha struck a painting, it was there a lot of pain in his leg. So he cut the skin where the blood has been gathered and removed the uh, uh, interrupted blood and made, uh, made ease to the Buddha. So Lohitupada is like uh, damaging the Buddha's body. Damaging doesn't mean damaging the skin, it cannot be done without the consent of the Tathagata. So this is also, if someone does this Kamma, this is also very heavy Akusala Kamma. Arahanta Gataka. Arahanta Gataka means killing a human Arahant. Because uh, Lohitupa, there is no Kamma called Buddha Gataka. Because Buddha cannot be killed by uh, by others. Buddha mentioned in Vinaya Pitaka, it is impossible monk. It is impossible. When the Devadatta was attempting to kill the Buddha, monks got uh, agitated a bit. 
they were rallying around the Buddha's monastery and they were protecting the Buddha's room. They were like like a protest, like they were they were going to protect the Buddha. So Buddha asked, why why what is this sound? Why monks are uh, in, what, what are they doing surrounding my kuti? Like so they they said Devadatta is attempting to kill you, so we want to protect you. So they were like going to uh, watch the Buddha throughout the day and night. They were going to guard him. Then the Buddha mentioned, don't worry about me. It is impossible, monks. Uh, Tathagata's life can be destroyed by any other person. Tathagata will always have uh, a natural death. So therefore it is also fundamental. That is why we don't have a uh, Buddha Gataka Akusala Kamma. Only Buddha's blood can be interrupted by evil intention. Arahanta Gartana means killing a human Arahant. Uh, mother, father and uh, Arahant. The killing has to happen by uh, uh, killing a human mother, human father, and a human arahant by a human being. That is uh, another fundamental in our sasana. I'll come to that point at the end of the uh, five heinous deeds. So before that, with regard to arahanta gataka, there is one point that should be mentioned. Now someone attempts to kill a person, a putujana for an example, he hits him or gives him poison. So the person doesn't die immediately. The person doesn't die immediately. But that strike, the blow he gave or the poison that he gave to the victim remains in the body and he dies after suffering after some time. It takes time for him to die. right? So during that time, the person attains arahanthood. So it says that because, because of his blow, someone dies. One who died, even though he gave the blow while he was a putujana, he died as an arahant. So therefore, he commits the killing of an arahant. So even though he gave the blow while he was a putujana, and it took time for him to die with the same blow, because of the result of that blow, because of the bee poison, if it was poisoning. So uh, since the death of an arahant happened, caused by him, he is committing an arahanta gataka. So then Matu Gataka, Pitu Gataka, killing one's own mother and father. So if you go to the page number 52, first paragraph. It is mentioned that all five heinous deeds can be done only by a human. The reason is the sharpness of their mind and bravery in wholesome and unwholesome deeds. In the Titana Sutta, Buddha mentioned that humans in Jambudipa are more brave, mindful than others in Uttar, than those in Uttarakuru and also deities in Tavatinsa. Therefore, our literature, our tradition has advocated the idea that Anantariya Kamas are fully found only in the human realm and also among the humans in the Jambudipa. Jambudipa means we all of us. So. Uh, and also, when it comes to killing an arahant and one's own mother and father, the next paragraph, the victims also should be human. The reason is, when both the executor and the victim are humans, the strength of the kamma is higher due to slaughtering a being of the same species. So it's like killing your own species is considered is more heavier and also more mean. So therefore, uh, 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 how to say these five heinous deeds, which are the uh, maximum of the Akusala Kamas, uh, one type of a maximum, especially in killing. So it has to be done by a human. Why the human mind is sharp, sharper than the animals and the other beings. So the level of the Kama is very high, and also it has to be done against another being who is on the same species. So the karma, the level of the karma is higher. So because of these reasons, something to be called anantarya. Anantarya means something uh, surely would surely give rebirth in the next life. The executor and the victim both should be human. So then 10.81, out of the five heinous deeds, I'm talking about the five heinous deeds. If someone has committed all five, all five, unfortunately, I, I, know, I hope no one would do that, all committing all five. There is a story uh, mentioned in another tradition about the Asoka story, not in the Theravada tradition. A person committing three heinous deeds. Devadatta committed two, 
Sangha Beda and Lohit Upada. There was a person who was an extreme killer from very childhood. He liked to kill others. This is a story mentioned in the Asoka's, uh, 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 about the Asoka in India. So he used to, he killed his mother, father, and in the end, he also killed an Arahant, all three. So then, uh, uh, in the end, King Asoka, uh, because Asoka, he asked from, Asoka took him as the executor of the, of the, of the kingdom, of his, of his region. So then he gave a certain confined area. Then he mentioned, whoever enters this area, you can, he was given the right to kill this anyone who comes in so so unfortunately one as i remember one arahan came and killed him and he already killed his mother and father so then one time when the asoka came to the uh, in, inside the uh, confined area he tried to kill the king so then he that time he made a mistake so in the end asoka uh, executed him so this is a story which says that uh, he a person has done three heinous deeds in the same life. So this is uh, found in uh, uh, books mentioning about the Asoka's life. Then uh, in our tradition, we have a person who did the heinous deed, two heinous deed, that is Devadatta, breaking the unity of the Sangha and shedding the Buddha's blood. So out of the five, 10.81, out of the five heinous deeds, Sangha Beda is considered the most powerful. If someone has done all five, only the Sangha Beda will give the next rebirth. Others, others, uh, other Kamas are unable to give the next rebirth. They can give rebirth in Sansara. But when we talk about Anantariya, we are specifically talking about the rebirth in the immediately following that. <coughs> Since one Kama can give a rebirth, so only the powerful one would get the opportunity, Sangha Beda. If he has done the remaining four except Sangha Beda, Lohitupada will give the result. If he has done the last three, Arahanta, Gartaka, killing mother, father, killing Arahanta is more heavier. Killing mother and father, if someone has killed both the mother and father, it mentions who is more virtuous. If the father is virtuous, killing father is more heavier. If mother is virtuous, killing mother is more heavy, uh, is heavier. Then if both are virtuous and both are unvirtuous, killing mother is heavier because mother does the most difficult part, difficult sacrifice to the child and also she is more helpful her assistance is higher than that of a father so therefore if the both are of equal quality <coughs> killing mother is more heavy than uh, killing the father so these are the uh, five list of the five uh, according to their strength so then 8 10.82 uh, concluding this lecture i would also like to talk about this point uh, 10.82 above explanation seems to contradict with designating unwholesome Garuka Kammas as Niyata and Anantariya. Why? We mentioned in the Niyata and Anantariya. Niyata means fixed. Anantariya means would surely give rebirth after death, immediately after death. So I mentioned now, we mentioned if there are five, if he has done all the five, only one would give the next rebirth, not the other four. Other four would support it. But they are not going to give the rebirth. So the designation was something which is fixed to give the rebirth. Something which is sure to give rebirth immediately after death. So if when someone has done two or three Anantariya Kammas, if something, if uh, another four get unproductive in terms of giving the next rebirth, this designation seems not very accurate. So our tradition has... Uh, uh, illustrated uh, explain this point Mulatika lucidly clarifies this argument this inherited attribute of fixedness of the Anantariya Kammas rests in the nature of being unpreventable from producing their results by another Kamma of different nature or by a wish why do we call something a fixed Kamma why do we call something would surely give results after death because it's unpreventable unpreventable by a dissimilar kamma or unpreventable by a wish. It means Anantariya, one who has done Anantariya kammas, he does lots of merits, but those merits are not going to stop him giving the next rebirth. So he make a strong wish that may I be born in a good heavens. That wish is not going to take him to a good place. 
so if, even he is crying he will be born in the woeful realms so likewise fixedness or the uh, how to say it, nature of giving immediate rebirth in after the death is resting on its nature of unpreventable nature by a different karma or by a wish so therefore there is no any karma that can prevent the fixed deeds from yielding their results and the second jhana stops the first jhana from producing vipaka when you have second after the second jhana you will be born the second jhana realm. the first jhana is unproductive in that sense moreover there is no wholesome action that can completely terminate the resulting ability of an anantariya karma no wholesome karma can terminate its ability in giving a rebirth in addition there is no wish that can hold these fixed karmas from bearing their results as the wish of a virtuous person possessing jhana can stop results of jhanas and lead to a rebirth in the karma realm. a person who has jhana may wish sometimes may be born as a human may be born as a deva his wish can take him to the deva or karma realm instead of taking the jhana, uh, brahma realm so likewise higher jhanas can stop the lower jhanas and sometimes divarnas can completely destroy the jhanas and also uh, a wish may stop the product uh, rebirth in the brahma realm and give a rebirth in the cause a rebirth in the uh, karma realm so likewise these anantariya kamas cannot be prevented by any means so that is why they are called fixed these unwholesome anantariya kamas drag their doers to awful realms against their desire only anantariya kamas have this unpreventable nature hence only they can be called niyata kamas and the thing is when someone has done few anantariya kamas only one gives the uh, rebirth others doesn't get the opportunity doesn't getting the getting not getting the opportunity is is not preventing them because only one kamma can produce one rebirth so therefore these kammas even though when someone has done many kammas when only one gives the rebirth even when the others become unproductive it doesn't mean that they are should not be called niyata they still can be called niyata according to the mulatika the definition of niyata and anantariya is based on uh, uh, on niyata and anantariya is based on the intrinsic quality of the deeds and not on their time of ripening certain akusala kammas are designated as niyata and anantariya kammas not because of their nature of yielding result at a specific time immediately after that but due to their inherited characteristic of unfailingly bearing results if an opportunity is found so when the opportunity is given they would surely bring result so these are the points that i would like to discuss in this lecture we mentioned we started the lecture of the uh, order of giving a rebirth there are four types of kamas garuka asana achinna and katatha and we specifically focused on the garuka kamas in this lecture there are two types of garuka kamas kusala and akusala akusala garuka kamas are two fold three fixed wrong views five heinous deeds three wrong views are nature uh, how to say uh, nartika ditti akiri uh, akiriya ditti nartika ditti and ahetuka ditti denying the kamma denying the vipaka denying the reasons for the purification and defilements of sansara then the sangha five heinous deeds sangha veda lohitu pada uh, arhanta gataka matu gataka pitu gataka all these five heinous deeds has to be done by humans and the last three deeds should be done against humans because uh, the human mind is the sharpest mind among the uh, in terms of doing kammas and when someone kills another uh, another being of the same species the kamma is more higher and then still uh, if someone has done uh two or more anantriya kammas there is an order how they would give the next reaper yeah these are the points that i would like to discuss and uh, next lecture i would continue with the remaining topic if you have any questions yes i'm just curious for the sangha veda breaking yeah. the sangha you know i have before there's only one sangha yeah. under the the buddha right hmm. and after that the divide many branches many conditions and so forth so just take the the very first division which is for let's say 
reason for the speed to be to, to, to different direction you consider the person who is Mr. Hadassah, I mean, uh, what is it, Barajika? Yeah, thank you for your question. Like, uh, because uh, the Devadatta's incident, we find a Sangamina Kama, but also, as you mentioned, after 100 years, roughly 100 years, <coughs> There was the initial split between the Sangha as Theravada and Mahasangika. Right? So this Theravada and Mahasangika happened because of a dispute among the uh, uh, regarding Dhamma facts and Vinaya facts. According to our tradition, it was ten Vinaya facts. According to their, uh, according to Mahasangika's tradition, it was five Dhamma facts. So, uh, some one uh, Chinese uh, pilgrim he mentioned that both the facts were reason Dhamma and Vinaya facts for the initial dispute. So, this kind of a dispute is like uh, they some would hold that this is how we would follow the Dhamma. Another one would say this is how they would follow the Dhamma. Uh, so. That is like, for example, the entire Sangha was divided into two groups and they would not start, they would not start associating them, uh, each other again, right? So, uh, it is very difficult to say because uh, in the Devadatta's issue, we say that he did it purposely, knowingly that this was wrong for the, to gain the support of the Sangha and for him to become the president of the Sangha. So, in this case, we don't know what were their motives, actual motives. So we find that the, uh, one group was getting the laxity of the uh, in Vinaya. They were finding like uh, changing some Vinaya rules. So another group didn't like it, and they started to have a, a council and start to uh, uh, found this is the real Dhamma and this is the wrong Dhamma. This is the wrong Vinaya. This is correct Dhamma. And then the people start to gather around them. So if, I would say, if the initial falls were made with the wrong, uh, wrong motive to break the Sangha and to uh, uh, make his group more larger, that would be in the side of the Sangha Beda. But for example, if someone considered that this is the time, this is how we should interpret, this is how the Vinaya should be followed, if he honestly comes into such conclusions and starts to advocate and develops his group, this is not considered as Sangha Beda. I think because uh, it's like there should be the evil motive of knowing that this would break the Sangha and my group will be more, more higher. So, in these cases, my personal, I am not giving an exact answer, what I personally feel is, so in the Mahasangika's uh, case, they were coming to laxity of the uh, rules and they were changing the rules and maybe they were following because for this laxity, there was a, there was a uh, uh, allowance given by the Buddha before his passing away. Buddha mentioned, if you wish, you can remove certain Vinaya rules, the minor Vinaya rules. Maybe that was the reason then, maybe that was the reason they were uh, uh, initially, that is why maybe they followed that certain Vinaya rules should be changed. Maybe I'm not saying, there are many possibilities that we could think. And also, the, another group of monks, we were, the, another was very orthodox and they're following strict Vinaya and Dhamma very perfectly and if you talk, look into the five for example the ten Vinaya facts reported in our in our in our books Theravada books these are Vinaya facts but if you go to the Dhamma facts all the facts are concerning Arahans so there were five facts that they would say Arahan still remain has some delusion still have some doubt and so forth so some scholars interpret that this was uh, uh, because arahants were considered the highest among the among the, within the sangha, so this was uh, 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 one kind of a movement against to show that arahants also have defects. So therefore, their their sayings are not the perfect uh, are perfect. Uh, their decisions are not perfect. So so they were. There some scholars would say that they were making a radical movement 
to to uh, challenge the authority that were uh, taken by the arahants of that era. So likewise, there can be different motives for this kind of thing. So they are so therefore, uh, uh, it can be because of some valid reasons, or that can be because of wrong interpretations. So none of our sasana, none of our traditions, neither the Theravadians nor the Mahasangikas interpret this as a Sangha Bedaka because we cannot clearly see their evil intention of breaking the unity of the Sangha and developing their own group. This was based on maybe because of some misinterpretations, because of the uh, geogra geographical uh, area or because of the distance between the, from the Sangha, there can be many reasons for this kind of a dispute. So, none of our traditions consider this as a Sangha Bhedaka, even though when the, when the dispute was happening, Theravadians had their own council, Mahasangikas had their own council in different regions, but still we don't consider this as a Sangha Bheda. We may say the Sangha was broken into few groups, but, uh, for example, uh, we also have uh, information when the, there was, a, uh, two, uh, there was a, uh, some kind of, a, I would not call a dispute, disagreement between two Arahans. We can find some information. When the, after the first council was done, uh, Mahakasapa re-explained uh, what they dis discussed in the council to a venerable call uh, uh, Purana. Purana, 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 Venerable Purana, uh, who was coming from the Dakina Pata. So, after listening to Mahakasapa's explanation, he said, You have done the council well, but there are teachings that I have heard from the Buddha directly. So, I would follow them as I have heard. So, this shows that there was a slight kind of a, a disagreement, a little bit. So, when we come into one of the 18 sects, we have a sect called Mahisasaka. This Mahisasaka sect claims that, that they are coming from the Venerable Puranas group. So, according to them, Mahisasaka, there was another monk that is called Gavampati. They, he, uh, because of him, there was another group. So, these two groups, uh, differed from Theravadins because not because of Dhamma facts, because of Mahinsasakas, because of seven Vinaya rules, Dhamma, Dhamma Guttikas, because of eight Vinaya rules. And they claim they are coming from two different Arahants. So if their sources are authentic, it seems like because even they were Arahants and they used to have different ideas about few Vinaya rules. So when this kind of Differences are there. We don't call it a Sangha Beda. We call it that they are not matching with each other. Sangha Beda is with an evil intention that you break the Sangha to increase your group. That's how I would explain. Even though one of the reasons, most of the reasons, even the eighteen reason of this group. Yes. The main factor we have to be the evil intention. Yes, I would call it. Yes, that is how I would explain. So in case of Devadatta, yeah. so he would be a Sangha Jika, Parajika, yes. Okay, and then the 500 monk would be a Tulachya, yes. What about the three one? They also Tulachya, ended up being Tulachya. Even though they have the equal intention? Yes, yes. But they would not consider no, a Parajika? No, no. Only the one who does the leader would be considered as the Parajika. Not even Sangha Jika? No. Sangha Disesa rule is Sangha Bedan Vattaka Sangha Disesa Sangha Bedaka Sangha Disesa is when the Sangha Bedaka or the Anvattaka, ones who are with evil intention, are attempting to make the Sangha, break the Sangha, the other monks have a responsibility to take him to the Sima among the Sangha and advise, don't do it. So when they are thus advising the monks, if he doesn't give up his intention, then he commits Sangha Disesa. This Sangha Disesa rule comes, something which happens before the Sangha Veda. So when he, they are attempting, other monks have a responsibility that we have to gather him and tell, don't do it. The monks who are following him also gather him and tell, get him and tell, don't do it. If they don't follow their advice, these two rules, so at the end of the Vinay Kama, they commit Sangha Disesa. But doing the Sangha Beda is a different thing. 
if they do the Sangha Veda, the first monk get, commits Parajika, other monks commit three uh, Tulachya, other monks with even uh, all monks commit, who participate commit Tulachya, uh, knowingly or unknowingly. So the Sangadi Sesa happens before. Now, for example, Devadatta's case and uh, in, the, in the Sangha Veda, they had no opportunity to do this Vinayakama. So no one committed Sangadi Sesa in our uh, Sangha Veda mentioned in our Sasana. The, the monks could not bring Devadatta and admonish him. Monks could not bring the three monks and admonish him. So they committed the Sangha Veda and uh, how to say it, uh, they ended up uh, in the hells. Yes. The three with the evil intention commit heavier karma, yes. but less karma than the Devadatta. Uh, no, higher karma, uh, less karma. Yes. Yes. Then were that, but uh, higher than the five hundred, less than Devadatta in terms of karma that they committed. Why, in terms of being yeah, they have the same like you know uh, repentance. The vinaya is not always based on the karma. For example, uh, for for instance. Uh, if we take uh, uh, Buddha Gama, or we take, uh, uh, you know, using the water with the creatures, there are some, for some water using when the creatures are found, like for the mosquitoes and all. So if we do it, if someone does it with the evil intention of killing, or with the, with the, with the intention of destroying, right? So, uh, it means uh, he may, or without carelessness, like he doesn't care about it. He may commit the Akusala Kamma because uh, he does it with the, uh, how to say, without bothering them. Like but he commits two offenses, like uh, using the water with the creatures and also killing the creature. But some may also just with a pure mind, without bothering, like that is their own Kamma. He may use the water. But he commits the offense, but he is not committing any karma. So the uh, level of karma is not proportionate with the uh, offense always. It is different. So the other monks, actually, as you, I want to mention thing, uh, the other monks who are without evil intention doesn't commit any karma. They don't commit any karma because they have no idea that they are participating in a heavy karma. Heavy karma, heavy karma. <laughs> yes, yes. But uh, it's like this. Uh, our Mahatera once said a very nice statement. Apati is desana gamini. You can purify it by the apati, by confession. Kama is vedana gamini. Kama has to be uh, uh, finished by suffering. So therefore, it's like uh, it's a nice statement. Apati is vedana, uh, desana gamini. Not all apathies, most of the apathies. They come up, you commit by the apathy, it's Vedana. You get out of the Kama by experiencing the suffering, right? So, therefore, there are two things. Yeah, they became Arahants, the other 500. Okay, so then we'll take a break and start.